Nice. Go for it. Hello, everyone. I'm Farhad Mehta. On the behalf of the Zurihack Organizing Committee, I would like to welcome all of you to Zurihack 2020, the Social Distancing Edition. Since we are currently in the middle of a pandemic, we are not able to meet in person as planned at the HSR. Nevertheless, I hope that we will have as good a time online and hope that we'll be able to welcome you in person at the HSR next year. I would like to introduce you to the other organizers of this year's Zuri Hack. Jasper, wait for us, cool. Uh, Yuri, yeah, that's Yuri, and Baike. Great. So I think Bika, you will introduce a little bit uh, how to participate. Yes. So Zuriac 2020, what is happening? Clearly we are all remote this year, but we're still having Zuriac. Our goal is the same. It's collaborating, learning, teaching, and socializing with each other. We will be using Discord as our hub this year. Everything important will be posted in our channel announcements, like when a talk goes live or when a track is about to start. You can always ping one of the organizers or the moderators by using the handle at moderator in any chat or use the help desk channel if you have a question or if you want to set up another channel. The talks will be streamed on YouTube and the links will be announced in announcements. So how can you participate this year? You can hack on a project. You can surf to our website, zurihack.com and go to the projects page. All the projects will be listed on this page or you can also add your own project. You can watch a talk on YouTube live or later as everything will be recorded. You can also join one of our tracks, the beginner track, the advanced track or the GHC track or present something that you are interested in a project or a favorite topic in our hallway channel or hold your own workshop and ask in the help desk channel for your own channel. And most importantly, you can also socialize with each other in one of our social challenges channels, sorry, um, like Lakeside, Ola, barbecue, coffee machine, and talk with everybody else. This is the schedule of this year. It is pretty packed, but you don't have to participate in everything. You can do what you want to do. Everything that I've just said will be on zurihack.com and it will also have our up-to-date info. You can also add the schedule from our previous slides to your Google Calendar by serving to this website. And of course, keep an eye on our announcements channel. Yuri will run you through all the talks now. Yeah, so uh, here's the talks that we're going to have, uh, like a really exciting lineup. I'm personally very eager to uh, participate in those. Um, I'll let you have a look. I won't read them out loud, but the um, talk following this uh, opening ceremony is the one by Rob Ricks at quarter past. Um, so uh, how can you participate during talks? Um, we, I think this enabled the um, YouTube uh, live chat feature. So because we will have um, the discussion going on in Discord. And uh, feel free to just you know, write there whatever you want to each other. Uh, during the talk, towards the end of the talk, you can ask questions and you can upvote them. And um, we will make sure that uh, we relay them to the speaker. So uh, Jasper will just read them out loud and make it a little bit more less chaotic to, to get your questions to the speaker. Um, we also have a really exciting beginner track lined up. So this is uh, four sessions, all basically um, belonging together. So uh, you're encouraged if you start to, to do uh, that whole chunk. And it's we really made sure, and what, uh, Julie and Chris Martin make sure to make this accessible to any level of beginner. Um, so one possibility, for example, is that we uh, all the exercises can be done on Replit. So if you don't have an account on that yet, you can, you can do that now. It's basically uh, an online coding environment where you can just um, uh, have simple Haskell code be compiled and it's zero setup, so it's uh, super easy to get started on it. 
And then um, kind of mashing in with the beginners track, uh, an optional event uh, that we're very excited about is the mob programming session. So physically, this has um, been done in the past uh, by Caroline and Gail. Um, and it looked like a lot of people around one computer collaboratively programming. Um, remotely, it will be that um, we have capacity for 28 people to log into a Visual, a Visual Studio Code um, live share session. So you can install that plugin. We'll give you more details. Um, and then we will also stream it on Zoom. So if there's 100 people in the beginners track, you can all watch. But only 28 people can participate. And uh, you will collectively try and program Space Invaders, which is really cool. Um, we have an advanced track to independent sessions um, by our friends at uh, WellTyped. And then uh, we have GHC tracks. Uh, similar to last year on uh, really exciting and advanced topics. So feel free to join those. And they are also independent of each other. So you can just join um, as many or little sessions as you want. With this, I give over to Jasper. Hey, so hi, everyone, and welcome again. Um, we're using Discord as a main sort of platform this year. Um, I'm also fairly new to using Discord. Um, so here are a few quick tips that are pretty essential. Um, because every project has a channel, there are a lot of channels. Um, you can use Control K or Command K if you're on a Mac uh, to switch through channels and sort of find the projects that you're interested in more easily. Um, by default, in the voice channels, if someone leaves or joins, a sound will play. This gets very annoying if you're like 20 or 30 people in a voice channel. So we recommend turning that off in settings notifications. Um, if you are not sure if your mic or your webcam uh, is working correctly with Discord, you can also test that yourself if you go to settings and then voice and video. Um, we have a few rules. All, um, the most important rule is to be friendly and welcoming, especially to, to newcomers, of course. We do have a code of conduct. We're using the Berlin code of conduct. You can find the exact text of that on the berlincodeofconduct.org website. Um, then if you etiquette things, if you're in a voice conversation, obviously try to remember to mute yourself if you're not actively speaking. Um, this is pretty important, for example, if there's a lightning talk going on in that voice channel. Um, if you have any issues with any of these things, um, please uh, use the help desk channel in Discord. Um, or if it's uh, not something suited for a public channel, you can always contact the moderators privately. Um, because this year is a virtual edition of Zuri Hack, we require far less resources than what we would need for uh, a real life event. But we're still very thankful to all the sponsors who committed to sponsoring us this year. We've reimbursed all of them, but um, yeah, we still wanted to give them a shout out. A lot of them are hiring. If you're interested in a Haskell job, maybe uh, be sure to check out the jobs channel on Discord. Um, there are a lot of people that helped this year. Um, they've done a lot of small and big tasks during the year. Um, everyone has also been very open to us moving towards uh, a fully remote event. Uh, so thank you for that. Um, in short, uh, there's been a lot of volunteers. Uh, thanks to all of you, and we love you a lot. OK, that's the end of the opening presentation. We hope you all have fun during Zuri Hack 2020. Um, we're going to go live with Rob Stock uh, on this same stream in about exactly five minutes. Uh, so hope to see you all then.
Hey, so hi everyone again, um, and welcome to the first talk of, uh, of ZuriHack, um, which is going to be by Rob Ricks. Um, hi, Rob. Um, Rob works at GitHub, uh, where he leads the development of Semantic. Semantic is a novel uh, advanced static site analysis tool that understands a bunch of programming languages. It's, of course, written in Haskell, and it uses effect systems fairly heavily, um, and it's built upon uh, fused effects. Uh, which is a package also authored by Rob. Um, and he's going to talk to us today about effect system. Uh, and his talk is called Languages All the Way Down. Um, so if you have any questions during or after the talk, you can ask those in the talk discussion um, channel in our Discord, and we will forward them to Rob. Um, Rob, word is up to you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, let's see, share my screen. Um, I think that's the one I want. There, okay. Uh, hopefully that's visible for everybody. All right, hi. Um, as Jasper said, I'm I'm Robert Ricks, uh, and I work at GitHub on the Semantic Code team. Um, I've been working on the semantic project for, for something like five years now, um, going on five years, I guess. And really my interest, uh, while while this project is useful for a variety of things, for example, it's what backs the code navigation features on GitHub, which allow jump to definition and find all references for a variety of languages. And yes, we also would like Haskell to be among them. Um, the interest for me is really in, in program analysis and in bringing the, the tools and techniques of uh, language design and language uh, analysis to languages and environments that haven't typically enjoyed them. Um, I'm just going to bump up the font size a little bit. Uh, I'm not sure that I can do that as easily in the terminal, but um, regardless. Um, my background is also had a lot of interest in languages. Um, in fact, my interest in languages really started when I was a teenager. I was still learning to program very much so and went through a variety of environments where I kind of hit the, the limit of what you could actually do in the environment reasonably quickly. For example, it didn't turn out to be too possible to, to write a bootloader in, in HyperCard. Um, that finally, of course, led me to C, which finally I could do everything that the machine could for better or for worse. Um, but ultimately, I ended up getting really frustrated with the, the problem that I wanted to, I knew what, how I wanted to write the code, I knew what I wanted to express, and I knew how it wanted, I wanted it to execute, but I couldn't express it the way I wanted in C. It would require a lot more boilerplate or a lot more duplication, semantic duplication than I really intended it to have, than I, than I wanted. And so I couldn't express things as elegantly as I wanted. Well, eventually I learned to write a parser, as one does. Um, and wrote a large number of really terrible languages. Uh, I think it's really telling that I haven't actually written almost any code in any of them. So don't be too impressed. They were tiny and they were terrible. Um, but it was really an important experience for me because it really helped me understand the utility of these techniques. And so my goal as a developer overall is to, to really help bring more of the, the capabilities of language design into library and application development. Now, I should note there are a couple of caveats that this sort of like segues nicely to. Um, for example, there's this affliction that's fairly common to compiler developers and fairly well known, whereby once you've worked on compilers, everything starts looking like a compiler's problem. And of course, I maintain that that's because everything actually is a compiler's problem. But regardless, you might want to bear that in mind as we continue. Uh, likewise, I'm going to be assuming some familiarity with monads and monad transformers, but not, not too much in terms of implementation details. Um, and likewise, while we're going to be talking about algebraic effects and handlers, which is this fairly general concept that's applied in a variety of different languages, we're going to be focusing specifically on the fused effects package, which I implemented because it's the one I'm most familiar with. Um, but m almost everything that we talk about is going to be portable to basically any effect system. Um, and then finally, our definition of what algebraic effects and handlers are, we're going to start off without one and then start up, then continue with an informal one and sort of refine it as we go. So um, the word effect is really heavily overloaded in, in programming, and I'm unfortunately just adding to that by, by this, uh, this means. But 
Uh, hopefully, as we refine this definition, things will become more clear. I have two main points that I want to make in this talk. Um, the first is that effects and handlers are a pragmatic, useful engineering tool for the kinds of problems that we run into in industry in particular. Um, it might be easy to think of them as strictly a tool for understanding programming languages or as a modeling tool or as an academic language tool or something like that. But they are actually a practical tool that is useful today and in fact used today in projects like Semantic and in various other projects I've written. For example, I'll make reference to a, a game I've been developing, an OpenGL game I've been developing in Haskell called Starlight, which also takes a, a advantage of a, a bunch of this the perspective we're going to be discussing. So the utility of these tools really comes down to, to three key pieces, that effects and handlers allow us to have a great deal of abstraction, that that in turn enables a great deal of modularity, and that that also allows us to systematize our, our the way we apply various of the engineering principles that we want to use in our systems uh, within a real code base. Um, the general recipe that one follows in this case is to, to figure out a set of operations that relate to one another, to define the laws that connect them. Um, often at this point then to, to start actually writing actions against the code, even if you don't have an implementation, because things will compile and you can make sure that stuff makes sense at a very high level. Then to define implementations of them, handlers, and refine this iteratively guided by your experience using them. Um, that's a lot to, to bear in mind. We're going to look at it a little more, bit more as we go on, but that, that's the general recipe that one can follow with this sort of thing. And the second point that I want to make is that effects and handlers give us the opportunity or uh, allow us to a perspective that turns out to be really useful, that of language design as it reflects on application design. So really a way to view our systems through the lens of language design and a way to use the tools, techniques, and methods of language design in system application software design, pragmatic day-to-day -day work. Um, that comes down to a connection between language designers' uh, interest in syntax and semantics, connection between that and the software engineer's interest in interface and implementations. This allows us to have modularity at the appropriate boundaries, and even further allows us to bring approaches from compiler engineering into library and application development. It further allows us to take uh, tools and principles from software anal analysis, static analysis, program analysis, and instrumentation, and apply them in our own software. And I think most importantly, it offers us a perspective that can really lead us to a, a better way of thinking about reliability and about modularity, and, and we'll, we'll see more of that as we go on. Now, we're talking about Haskell, um, and so it's useful to start off with some of the properties of Haskell that we, we enjoy as, as programmers. Uh, Haskell is a lazy programming language. That's certainly a big differentiator, non-strict evaluation order. It's also a, a typed language, um, which is a, a kind of a, a great thing, um, and it's a pure functional programming language. We're going to be talking mostly about pure functional programming and only a little bit about types and not really at all about laziness. But functional programming is itself kind of a useful tool for engineering all by itself, right? And that's that boils down to the fact that it enables excellent modularity. So to give an example of this, we can take a function like double, which just takes some very, a value rather and doubles it, and another one, anchor, which adds one to it, and compose them together into this 2n plus 1 function, which we can see doubles the value of its argument and adds one to it. And so we can add, we can see how this operates as we, we go along. That means as a result of composing these things together, we can actually understand 2n two, two plus 1 at a very high level, strictly in terms of its component parts. And the, um, the value of doing this is, is really given to us by the fact that this is pure these are pure functions. We don't have to worry about any side effects coming into play because we're just doing operations which can't really fail, addition and multiplication, and composing them together into something that, that we can understand by these pieces in isolation. So understanding double and anchor is enough really to lead us to understand the combination thereof at a high level, certainly. Now, 
On the other hand, sometimes we do need to have side effects. We need to have something more complicated in terms of control flow. We might want to be able to throw exceptions or we might want to carry along some state as we're computing things. And at that point, it becomes more difficult to compose these things because for example, if we were going to compose uh, write file on read file, the types don't line up properly. We can see from this that the type of read file, uh, since it's returning an IO of string, isn't going to plug in nicely to the uh, type required by write file, which requires a string. So we see we expected something uh, here taking a file path to a string. And in fact, we got something taking a file path to an IO of strings. So write file would have to have some way of eliminating the IO action. Well, fortunately, composition is actually a much more general tool than strictly appears within the context of Haskell functions. One of the, it's a tool from category theory that I'm not gonna talk about in that context at all, but we can see that it's also actually apl applicable to monadic functions. So that's functions which perform some effects. So I'm gonna use the word for now, I'm gonna be using the words monadic and effectful and impure more or less interchangeably. Um, and we can see this in the example of copy file to standard error, for example, which will read a file, given some file path, it will read a file and then compose that onto a computation then that writes the contents of that file to standard error. And so we can see copy file to standard error. We can use this to dump out some secrets that we've stored on the file system. Uh, Clays loop composition turns out to be, which is what this operation is, is called. I usually call the operator itself the left fish operator for reasons that I hope are obvious. Um, you can see from its type though, that it's really closely related to our familiar dot operator, the, the pure function composition operator. It's related in the sense that it basically lifts the composition of functions through some monadic context on, in the domain of these functions. So given impure functions or effectful functions between B and C and A and B, we get an uh, effectful function from A to C. And so we can see that F on G, F dot G, is analogous to F left fish G. Um, it's essentially just the same concept of composition, just in a con context where now we can also deal with effects. And the only constraint that we have is that M, the context in question, is a monad. As a quick aside, we can see that there's also a similar relationship between the dollar operator and the left bind operator. Left bind might not be the one we're most familiar with, but it's the one that has the arguments in the right order to, for this analogy, analogy rather. And we can see that that the application of f to x using the dollar operator is really analogous to f b left bind x. Uh, the distinction being that um, our operations here um, are also able to perform effects, and it performs the effects on the argument before performing the ones on the continuation. I've just no noticed that I've actually lied here. And it's not actually a pure function. I, I will actually write that as a monadic function f, uh, because that's a copy paste error. Uh, so having corrected that, this leads us to, again, to, to our initial definition of effects, which is that effects are more or less equivalent to side effects. We're talking about cases where we have interesting control flow. So something more interesting than just pure function composition going on with the bind operator. And that might be, you know, carrying along errors, er errors rather, the possibility of failure, or carrying along state, or non-determinism, where we might be able to succeed arbitrarily many times or even just fail outright. Um, so in this context, effects is roughly equivalent to monads so far. Now, of course, we've already got ways to work with effects in Haskell. We've been doing this for ages under this definition, certainly. Uh, for example, we've already seen how we can use effects in IO. IO, unfortunately, has some challenges. It's a little bit of, the, of a kitchen sink. If we are given an action in IO with the type like IO of unit, we don't actually know what this thing is going to do. We have some vague idea that it might perform some side effects, but given that the side effects it could perform include you know, mutation of shared global state in the form of, for example, the file system, we don't really have many guarantees here. And that that is something that can make it, uh, that, that can be pragmatically challenging because we, we don't actually know, for example, that if we're given some innocuous action, that it's not gonna dump glitter all over our console like this. If we weren't expecting glitter to be dumped all over our console, this could be quite an unpleasant surprise. Worse, it could be do, doing something where we're mutating state 
on the file system, writing files in ordering suddenly becomes extremely important to otherwise disparate parts of the system, simply because we happen to have used the same file name in two different cases. For example, deleting something that we expected to still be around or writing overwriting a file's contents. So IO is not maybe the ideal expression of, of side effects for a number of reasons like that. On the other hand, we also have other monads which we can use to express errors. For example, either. Either gives us the ability to express an error with a, uh, a failure with a given error value. But either and monads in general aren't composable. If we have two monads, M and N, the composition of M on N is not in general itself a monad. And that makes it clumsy if we want to, to start with exceptions in either, but then add in some other effects as we go. It's not really very natural how to do that. And we don't have an example of here because we're gonna just move on to the solution to that problem. That is to say, monad transformers immediately. This is exactly what they were introduced to deal with. Now we can operate in a context which offers multiple different effects. In this case, state and exceptions. We can get the current state value and we can throw it after showing it. Um, and we have two different expressions of this, however, and that kind of hints at a, a brittleness that monad transformers have. This is kind of the challenge that, that we have with them is that the placement and number and ordering of lifts that are needed for any particular operation are determined statically by the list uh, or the structure of the type. So the fact that we have state t wrapping except t in this case versus except t wrapping state t means that even though these two programs do the same thing at a high level, they get the variable and then they throw it after showing it we have to express them differently. And notably, that means that we can't use these two together very naturally. We can't combine them by sequencing. We can't run them in with the same handler. Um, really, what we would like to be able to do is express something that is able to describe these operations without tying it to the concrete ordering of these things. And that really hints at a more general problem that IO, concrete monads, and monad transformer stacks all have, which is that they are coupling too much, really. It's a modularity problem. We have tight coupling here between the operations in these specific effects and these types. Likewise, we have tight, tight coupling in IO between the use of, of putting a string uh, onto standard error to the fact that it's the implementation of H put string line provided in IO. There's, we don't have a way to say substitute in something else. And, and that is really problematic if we want to do something like testing, where we're in an environment where we, we need to, to um, tightly control one part of the, the inputs or the, the context of a system in order to, for example, verify the results or in order to provide it the inputs that we want for, for example, property testing. Um, likewise, it means that if one part of the system is written with this ordering of monad transformers and another is written with this ordering, getting them to communicate together means that we have to do a lot of work. If we, we had these uh, components written independently and now we need to combine them, well, we've got a lot of work to do to change one or the other in each of the places that they occur or to duplicate everything to admit both orderings. That's the fundamental problem. It comes down to one of coupling is that these operations that we're mentioning, these lift or uh, sorry, get, throw, et cetera, operations are very tightly coupled to specific implementations. Really then what we want to have is abstraction. Um, and here we have an implementation of the same error and state sort of operation. And again, it's not really a very useful operation, but just to illustrate the, the general point, this is using fused effects. So we're, we're saying, that we have the availability, we, we have the capability to use error operations, throw error and catch error, as well as state operations, get and put. And because we have both of these operations, we can just use them within a single context. And we aren't coupling it to either the specific implementations given to these operations or to the ordering that they might occur in. There's no notion of ordering even possible with the constraints as written here. So it, it is abstracted over those constraints. We can see that the effects of these uh, uh, of this is that we can run with um, error outside of state, or uh, sorry, um, state outside of error, 
um, and get a result for the operation. But we can also run with the handlers in the opposite order, this being error outside of state, using the same program, interpreting it in both contexts. Now, you can note that there's some differences between the results. Here we threw an error, and that's all we have is the value in left in either. Here we also have a value in left, but we're also returning the final state, despite the fact that an error occurred. So the distinction here is one of semantics, but it's at a, in a limited sense. We've got different semantics for each of these ordering of handlers, but the meaning of the program in essence at a high level remains the same. We aren't compromising it in any sense. Likewise, we have guarantees about what operations can be performed. So for example, at the bottom here, I've got a glitter effect, which that, um, is intended to you know, dump glitter all over your console. And if you don't provide a handler for that, if you're just running in a pure context, for example, it just won't work. It doesn't type check. We don't have the capability of dumping glitter to the console in a, a context that doesn't provide a handler for it. By contrast, if we really do actually want to dump glitter to the console, well, now we have the ability to recover that via a run glitter handler, which is defined here. And I'm, I'm going to invite you not to look too carefully at the implementation here, since it's broadly irrelevant to our point. Thus, really what we want to have is a definition of effect that allows us to have a few key properties. So first of all, we want to have modularity. We want to be able to talk about components of our system independently of one another. Composability, we want to be able to use them within a shared context naturally and without tightly coupling to any particular ordering of these things. And finally, we want abstraction. And abstraction in this sense is really the same sort of polymorphism that we have with type classes or that we have in other languages, other environments via, for example, dependency injection or inversion of control, you might call it. Ultimately, it boils down to the same idea that you're passing in a parameter. It's parameterization a parameter that determines the meaning of these effects. And so by so doing, we're able to um, have a number of really important engineering benefits, like for example, being able to uh, very flexibly combine operations without coupling them too tightly, um, which is an important maintenance uh, uh, use case, as well as for example, mocking and stubbing in, in tests and so on and so forth. So through this lens, we can think of effects as being uh, as defining um, a set of operations as an interface. So an effect now, instead of just talking about effects in the abstract, we're talking about an effect. An effect is a de defining a set of operations um, as an interface. It's not specifying any implementations for them. And since this is Haskell, it's a typed interface. And a handler, on the other hand, gives an implementation for each of the operations within any effect that it handles. And so you can have multiple effects within a given context. You can also Hi, have Rob, multiple we have handlers. a question from the, the question channel. Um, they're asking how this relates to MTL and type classes. Great question. That's actually my, my very next sentence. So uh, we'll talk, we'll segue straight to that. So yeah, through this lens, Transformers doesn't qualify as an effect system because it doesn't give us the abstraction that we, we discussed. But MTL, for example, does. MTL is an effect system given this definition with the effects given as the monad reader, monad state, et cetera, classes that it provides, these interfaces. And the handlers provided by the instances of those classes for concrete monad transformers like state T and reader T and so on and so forth. Infused effects. The effects are defined as a data type and some smart constructors. And then the handlers are defined by algebra instances, instances of the algebra type class that fused effects provides, which relate one or more effects to uh, a monad transformer or in general a monad actually. Now I should note that monads and monad transformers aren't the only model for effect handlers. They're just the one that, one that MTL and fused effects happen to use. Um, but there are other effect systems out there which may or may not use this sort of model for, for defining implementation. So don't, don't couple it too tightly. And to give an example of, or uh, don't relate them too strongly rather in, in your, your mind. Um, and so as examples of other effect systems that really meet, do meet this definition, F, polysemy, et cetera, also meet this definition. And so we saw a moment ago how we can use handlers in fused effects or in MTL and other cases to uh, provide implementations. And that's, that's really all it is. The implementations are being provided by 
some type class in, in the case of MTL infused effects, and then the um, the operations are abstracted over them and you get to connect the two by the selection of some specific handler. There are also environments where you can just write the handler as like a function. Fused effects operate, uh, offers a an interpret handler that is polymorphic over the effect that it handles, for example. Um, but we're not gonna look at that here because it's, it's not really strictly relevant to our, our point. So the abstraction that we've been talking about so far is really important because, again, because of modularity. It allows us to separate interface and implementation. So we saw that effects give us interface, handlers give us implementation, and that separation is a really well-known engineering virtue for the purpose of modularity. But it also allows us to have a really clear delineation between the code that we wish to write and the code that we wish to execute. And we saw that already a little bit, where the definition of error and state abstracted thus doesn't have any complications with lifts occurring within it. So it's not just that we've avoided brittleness by avoiding that coupling, but we've also clarified the high level logic here. High level control flow is a little more obvious. That property of separating between delineation or separating this delineation between the code we want to write and the code we wish to execute is the exact same one that I was talking about right up front in terms of what my challenge was as a C developer. I wanted to be able to write code one way and have it do what I knew I meant without having to, to deal with the, the constraints of C, which wasn't really designed with that use case in mind. So for example, I wanted closures and I knew how I would want the closures to execute, how I would want them to be memory managed, et cetera but making that work naturally in C wasn't really possible at the time. Um, it also, though, allows us, to, by the same token, to have distinct execution strategies, which we can select by arbitrary means. And by distinct execution strategies, I mean, for example, having different orderings of the handlers that we're applying, which we saw before, which, as again, as we saw, means that we might have different semantics in terms of the, the specific return values and whether or not we get uh, a final state when an exception is thrown. But it also allows us to select other implementations. And that might mean, for example, a uh, an implementation which is more optimized for some specific set of inputs. That distinction turns out to be really important because that's essentially combined, these two, two points are really what compilers give us. They give us the ability to, to say, here's some, some language that we want to write our code in, here's some language that we want to execute our code in, which will probably itself be further compiled if that language is, for example, an intermediate representation, all the way down to machine code, which gets executed and possibly even interpreted as microcode by the CPU. Um, in a way, what we're doing then by using algebraic effects is allowing our, uh, our program design to take on some of the properties of compilers as well, to be able to choose execution strategies for a given program based on either our static knowledge of this ahead of time, or maybe even dynamically based on some runtime information we have. For example, the size of a set of inputs might determine different approaches we might want to take to an algorithm. Looking at this as a compiler's problem, or rather as the use of compilers approaches within software design kind of suggests an interesting perspective, which is one of program design as language design. Now, language design is concerned in large with syntax and semantics, where the syntax gives the structure of expressions, where structure might be given as a set of symbols and where they can occur. In our case, the set of symbols might be the operations of an effect and where they can occur would be determined by the types as well as by the availability of the bind and return operations that monads have, which we get by virtue of being in an effect system. And so we can identify the syntax with the effect. Likewise, semantics assigns each of these operations meaning, and there's many different models of semantics which give us a different understanding of what meaning entails. In our case, we're largely gonna be considering operational semantics without going into any detail about it. But we can think of meaning in this case as being control flow or implementation. And so we can connect the semantics in a language design sense with the handlers for an effect. 
this isn't my perspective on this, to be clear. This is actually fairly standard in the literature on algebraic effects. It very often refers to the operations of an effect as the effect syntax, and the handlers of an effect as providing semantics, defining semantics, really. And so we can see that in the same way as we connected syntax and semantics with effects just now and connected interface and implementation with effects earlier, Syntax and semantics and interface and implementation are really describing the same divide. This is a really applicable perspective on software engineering uh, just from that virtue alone. We have another question from the audience, Rob. Um, how do you decide what an effect is? How do you decide the granularity? Because, for example, I.O. is very broad and it can do almost anything. But Glitter seems very narrow since it can only do one thing, right? So how do you make this decision of how granular your That's a uh, fantastic question. Yeah, awesome question. So we're going to talk about this in a little more detail later. But for now, what I will say is um, I try to do this based on uh, use. Basically, um, do I have use cases that, that make me want to divide it down more finely? Um, as a quick example of that, in the initial release of fused effect, the error effect was defined monolithically. It had both throw and catch operations defined as part of it. Later on, we decided that actually we wanted to be able to represent situations where we can throw an error that can't be caught. So throw without catch. That, caught, uh, that use case prompted us to split error into separate throw and catch effects. And error is now actually defined as the, the conjunction of the two. Uh, as the availability of both of these. Likewise, non-determinism in fused effects was initially defined as empty and choose, where empty is, represents failure without a value, and choose represents the selection between two alternatives. And then you can select between more alternatives by chaining choose together. And so that, that's really the primary two operations of alternative, for example, is the empty and alternation operator, the, the um, Uh, that one, um, those operations, empty and, and alternation operators, are useful in combination, but they're also useful in isolation. Being able to re represent failure without choice using just empty, or representing choice without failure, and like a non-empty tree of computations, if you will, both of those turned out to be useful. And so as a result, we split those into separate effects as well. And now the non-dead effect that re remains is also the combination of these two more primitive effects. Um, it might suggest to you, well, maybe then I should just divide everything down to its most primitive form and say, actually, I'm going to put every single operation into its own effect. But honestly, you're probably creating more work for yourself by that. So I would tend to do this reactively in terms of experience using the thing, because that can really tell you, are these things actually fundamentally related, or are they actually separate? And so as an example of cases where we didn't divide, reader and state both provide an operation in state's case get, in reader's uh, case ask, which just returns some value from the context. They have the same type, even modulo constraints or whatever, uh, that of just m of s, whatever s, s being either the state type or the environment variable type. But if we split reader and state up into separate effects, well, local doesn't really make much sense without ask. And we're kind of removing a lot of power from the effect by removing it. And state without put is basically just reader without local at the same time. So like maybe that makes sense in some sense, but like we didn't have a concrete use case to employ. So we haven't gone down that path. We have considered it, but ultimately we felt like it would be creating more work and making things more complicated for ourselves. And so we, we left them combined. But that's a fantastic question. We're going to see a little bit more detail about this because that that general point of doing this in reactive to in reaction rather to use cases to the the forces that we feel as engineers as we're trying to do something and there's more friction there than we think there should be that sort of force is probably our in my opinion one of our best tools for guiding this but it's not our only one and we're going to look at another shortly. Um, so continuing on. Um, the perspective of syntax and semantics of interface and implementation and can the connection between those and effects really suggests that we can also think of language or effects as languages as an effect being a language now when i say language that's a really big word right we think about haskell haskell is a huge language and i don't know about you but i don't want to maintain haskell not all by myself 
Um, that's an enormous project. I've got other things I need to do. Likewise, Go, likewise other general purpose programming languages. They're enormous. That's a lot of work to maintain just for something that you're going to be using as part of a small system. And of course, that's really not the scale we're talking about when we're talking about like state and error. We're talking about you know two operations in each of those cases. Uh, so we might say domain specific language, and that gets us a little bit closer, I think. But SQL, for example, is an example of a DSL, and it's huge. Again, enormous compared to what we're talking about here. It has a huge number of connotations that are, are beyond what we mean. And it's not really easily possible for us to mix and match other bits of expression within that. SQL isn't really extensible. Embedded domain-specific language then maybe gets a little bit closer. We don't have to write a parser. That's pretty good. So that indicates we're talking about something a bit smaller. And that's probably the right term in an abstract sense, but it might not be quite specific enough because it still might bring something to mind like Rails DSLs. Ruby on Rails has a DSL called Active Record, or rather a sub library called Active Record, which provides DSLs for abstracting operations over databases. Um, but that's still quite a large and sophisticated bundle of operations that we, we might consider to be you know, a much larger scale than what we're talking about here. So the granularity at, at, at its minimum is like one operation. They can be basically arbitrarily small. They don't have to be, but they can be. So the scale we're, we're really thinking about is of languages, symbols, and semantics at the scale of a handful of operations. So maybe we might say micro languages, but then further understand that parts of this language are also being provided by the effectful context that we're working within. That's like the ability to uh, do return and bind, to combine expressions together in those ways, sequence of them rather. Um, and some of them are also gonna be provided by other effects. So while we talk about effects as languages, we're not meaning at these large scales, we're meaning, meaning extremely granular. And I'm, I'm going into all of this detail, not because the terminology is extremely important, but because I want to convince you that the perspective of effects as languages really has a lot to offer us. So for example, if we're talking about the error effect as a language, we're talking about the language of catchable failures with an error. So failure with a value and the possibility of catching it. If we're talking about reader as a language, we're talking about the language of a single locally configurable parameter. State is the language of a single mutable variable. And then as a quick aside here, when I'm saying the rather than a, that's notional. I'm not uh, suggesting that there's only one expression of the implementations of these things. For example, you can express state via get and put operations or equivalently by the state operation in the monad state type class, um, which can express both of these. Um, so it, again, it's not that there's only one implementation of this, but rather that the concept of something that can express those state operations, um, that's the uniquely determined thing. So it's the language, but not necessarily the implementation of that. Now, we might well think in terms of DSLs already. If you talk about some portion of your system that you've been defining for some particular part of your business domain, you might describe it as a DSL. We often, especially I think, do this for like nomadic DSLs, even specifically effectful DSLs. But it's not just the terminology of DSL that that and and thinking of the the set of, of APIs defined within a single module as being um, you know a, a, a whole that are intended to be used together that's really valuable here. It's the perspective of syntax and semantics. It's being able to to think of the, these operations as things that we can interpret in different ways, which kind of leads us into a potential cost. So abstraction isn't free. For one thing, abstraction tends to mean indirection because we're talking about abstract, well, actually, I think it always means indirection, in fact, now that I think of it. Um, when we have an action like error and state here, error and state is again specified in terms of these state and error operations, get and throw error in this case, and some constraints which say that those have to be provided as part of this context M, whatever it might be but it doesn't say what the actual code we're gonna be calling is, which means if we're just reading this, we don't actually have a way to like jump through to some specific instantiation of M. 
and the definition of get or of throw error that we have for that instantiation. If you are reading through code with um, a goal to understand it at a very low level, that can make things harder for you. And you might need to be stepping through the control flow very linearly in, uh, in GHCI, for example, in order to achieve that end. It can also sometimes be challenging if we're trying to understand code as a newcomer to a project, if we want to be able to understand how pieces fit together at different levels. Um, sometimes that's an indication that we've been using different layers of abstraction within the same level of uh, code. Um, but other times, it's honestly, it's just um, a fact that higher order functionality, parameterization, polymorphism, abstraction by this means, et cetera, is indirect. So it, it causes, it requires us to do a little bit more stepping around to understand the code in full as a whole. Often though, we find that cost to be worthwhile because we're able to understand something in the abstract without reference to specific implementations. It's possible to understand this error and state function without knowing what error and state implementations or handlers we're gonna be using. That's an important property. It's just not the only perspective that we might want to have on our system. Potentially, there's also uh, challenges for efficiency. And I'm not going to be talking too much about efficiency other than to say that Fused Effects was motivated by um, Nicholas Wu and Tom Shriver's work on Fusion for Free, which enables us to take as much advantage of GHC's uh, inliner and uh, specialization as possible. We've had good results with it, but it's still the case that if you're passing in a parameter, it's like a V table. It's a dynamic lookup. And, there are cases when you might want to not have that. You might want to monomorphize it as great, uh, to as great a degree as possible. For example, by throwing some more compiler time at it, ideally. Um, so again, I'm not going to be talking about this any more de in any more detail, but I would invite you to watch Alexis King's talk because that's very much her topic, is how to deal with the efficiency considerations in an implementation context. And I'm personally extremely excited for that. There's another one, though, which is a little bit tricky, which is one of semantics. If you've been given an operation like put, how do you know that it's actually going to use the argument? So looking at the type of put, I'm going to scroll down a little bit here, and we see that we have types for get and put. Get is saying that in some context providing state of type s, a, a mutable variable of type s, we can get that variable's value in the context. And put is saying that given the same con sort of context, we can take a new state value and return an action that doesn't return a new value, but that just does something. But that something that it does is unspecified. We don't have linear types, so we don't have any guarantee that S has been used. S could be silently dropped, and we would get an implementation of put that would type check. That seems like a problem. If you've got a recursive graph traversal, for example, and your recursive graph, graph traversal is using the state effect to provide a guard on recursive traversals such that it records visited nodes in a set. And put has been implemented by somebody else somewhere else as a no-op. Now, as soon as you hit a cyclic graph, your function is going to infinite loop. That's clearly not the result that we want. Um, therefore, we need to have some guarantee that put isn't going to drop rights, that it's going to be consistent with our assumptions about it. Those assumptions, again, aren't something that we can encode naturally in the types. Even with Haskell being as uh, type happy a language as it is, it's just not something that we have a convenient way to express right now. Um, as a result, type classes, which also run into this problem, frequently use laws to, to describe other constraints on the behavior of their methods. And so we can see that in the case of, for example, the functor law. The functor law states that given the fmap, given some implementation of fmap, it should be equivalent to compose together fmaps of functions f and g, or to do a single fmap that composes together f and g. And that's a, a fusion law, as it turns out. That functor law is essential for programs using or functions abstracted over a functor to be able to operate correctly. Although we often don't necessarily think of that because we can take it for granted because if you have a functor that doesn't abide by that law, code doesn't work with it the way you think it will. And so more or less people don't write that because having such a functor 
would be an unlawful functor. And that's a, you know, that's a dirty word to use about your implementation. Who would want to do that? Now, of course, there are cases where having that flexibility might be convenient for the, whatever reason, but it's usually marked with a huge caveat in the do documentation for exactly that reason. It violates assumptions. We have exactly the same situation here. And so we want to be able to express relationships between the operations of an effect. And in particular, we might expect to have a property like this one, which says that if you put a value and then you follow that up with a get, you're going to get the value that just got put, regardless of what the initial state value was or the previous state or whatever happens after it, this part of the program would be equivalent to just returning that, that value. Now, that said, that property isn't what we actually have defined for the, the uh, state effect. Now, I should also note that these are the laws that I came up with for the state effect. I don't remember how I came up with them. I don't, for example, remember if I got them from the transformers package or from MTL or somewhere else, or if I derived them. I probably didn't derive them because I'm honestly not that bright. But you'll note that they don't express anything of the sort. They don't actually relate get and put to each other at all. Each of them is defining the behaviors of get and put in relation to a run state handler. Now, in the case of a package like transformers, that might be with reference to some specific implementation of run state. But in our context, we're abstracting over the handler. We want to express these laws in a way that uh, should constrain every handler and not be specific to some specific one, or else it would be a law about the handler and not a law about the effect. Um, therefore, when we talk about run state, um, and I've got a bunch of detail here, and this is all pushed up on GitHub. So if you want to look at this in more detail later, you can. I'm not going to run through all of it myself. But you can you can think of the set of laws for an effect as being like parameterized by a handler. So something has to have supplied a handler, um, which we will locally call run state, which has approximately this type, um, and which, and by handler here, I mean a function rather. Um, which has approximately this type and which satisfies the laws that we've described. And so these are really what it's something that we might be able to provide in a property test, for example. So A would be uh, universally quantified by the property test as might K and B and even M, but run state would be constant for every handler that we're actually testing it against. So the laws remain abstract that this handler gets specified more concretely. But as a result of that relationship, we can relate get to run state, we can relate put to run state, and it's the same run state in both cases because it's quantified over essentially. Um, and as a result, that's actually, these two laws independently are enough for us to actually derive the property that we actually want. And you can see that in a little proof that I wrote down here. Uh, I was very proud of myself when I finally finished this because I think it was the first time that I'd actually successfully managed to prove something as far as I know. I haven't actually checked it in a proof assistant or anything like that. But it's important to note all of this detail, this derivation, the fact that we have these two separate laws, et cetera, that's not where we started. That's not certainly not where I would have wanted to have started if I could remember how I had done this in the first place. I started with the property that I wanted to hold. And I would encourage you, if you're thinking about defining operations as effects using whatever system, to do the same. Think about the properties you want to hold, because that's the important salient detail. And then maybe you can reduce that to something more pr primitive after the fact. If so, that's great. Heck, you might even be able to publish a paper about it. But you don't want to necessarily start with trying to figure out the most minimal, most primitive expression of this thing, because that's often going to be kind of irrelevant to what you actually mean at a high level. These properties are, yes, they're sufficient to derive the property we want. These laws are sufficient to derive the property we want, but they're not obviously so. I had to actually work out a proof to, to satisfy myself that that was the case. And so express the thing you care about first and work from there is, would be my advice. Um, likewise, we'll real quick touch on the laws for error. Um, here we have the law for throw error, which is described just in terms of run error and a continuation and bind. So what this says is essentially is that when you throw an error and then bind some other continuation on it, onto it, it's the same as if you hadn't bothered binding a continuation after it. Another way of thinking of this is that throw error aborts. 
Likewise, catch error is related directly to throw error. And it says that this combination of throwing an error and catching it with some handler is the same as if you had applied the handler to the exception directly. Now, you'll note that there's no reference to, like, what if you have something larger than throw error in this position? Because you, know, you probably wouldn't do this exact code sample. Well, in those cases, the monad laws and the other laws in play here give us the rest of the behavior. The behavior around sequencing operations, composing operations out of other operations, and importantly, the uh, inclusion of throw error here. Because we could say very obviously that, well, if we copy this in here, like substitute this uh, throw error bind k into here, then we can immediately reduce it by getting rid of the continuation into something that would be directly relating to this. So these laws are not the only ones in play. We also want to uh, keep in mind the existence of the monad laws, et cetera, since they give us the rest of the behavior of the system and the rest of the guarantees about the system. Um, how am I on time? I'm getting close. OK. So um, as we touched on, the simplest expression of these laws might not be obvious, so we want to start from desired properties um, because these laws are what give us the real depth of modularity that we want to have. Interface reuse is old hat in software engineering. That's not new. We've been doing that. Uh, I mean, the entire Gang of Four design patterns book is almost entirely concerned with the, the concept of interface reuse. Um, and that's the modularity we're talking about here. But the types aren't enough. The, the set of operations isn't enough. It's the laws that give us the ability to say that this part of the system and this part of the system agree in detail. But we don't want the laws to be too specific either, or else we're just back to coupling it to some concrete implementation. So laws should enable us to reason in isolation and to test in isolation, and even often to apply uh, other rules or reductions systematically so that we could have a handler that, for example, applies logging or something every time we put a variable um, but they shouldn't constrain our implementation too much further than that. We're going to express our behavior as equations in some minimal sense, but those equations need to ignore irrelevant details, uh, like implementation details, as, to as great a degree as possible. In short, we want to admit useful variants in implementations. And useful, what that word means, is going to really depend on the specific situation surrounding the effect in question. Um, they should also admit interactions with other effects. And as we touched on earlier, error-infused effects today is actually defined as the combination of two different effects, throw and catch. But catch isn't really useful on its own. It's only useful in relation to throw error. So the law for catch error absolutely does mention the, the throw error operation, which is coming from the throw effect, not from itself. Um, so it enables us to, to build non-orthogonal effects and in interfaces. So we have a question slash discussion from the audience. Um, they're wondering if you can do a state based on an uh, an underlying IO ref. Yeah, um, you should. And have. how you how you would talk about the laws in uh, either a concurrent environment or a non-concurrent environment? That's a fantastic question, and unfortunately, the concurrency point in general, I'm going to have to defer to the literature. Um, there is an entire like the pi calculus, for example, was developed by people trying to. Uh, understand the semantics of concurrent problems programs. And my general solution is not to have shared mutable state. Um, that's not necessarily the best answer. Uh, we will touch briefly, though, on, on a partial solution that works in some cases if you're willing to accept the caveat. So we'll get to that in just a sec. Because yeah, state is actually a really great example of this, because there's lots of different ways that we can implement state while still satisfying those laws. We could use state t. We could use the st monad. We could use an io ref in io. And in fact, I've implemented that myself. You're carrying along, essentially, you've got a reader that's carrying along the IO ref, and then you're doing uh, reads and writes from it. Uh, you can even use STM to guard writes atomically. But you should note that there is a significant caveat there regarding race conditions. Um, for example, using modify, you don't know that something else hasn't been written since the get was executed. Modify is not atomic. Put is atomic. Um, that caveat is really significant, but it still admits situations where, for example, you only want to perform writes on a background thread, and a foreground thread you want to only read from. So you can read and write in the background, only read in the foreground, 
there you don't have to worry about race conditions um, in that sense, but you still have atomicity between gets and puts and consistency in that context. And so for example, in my video game Starlight, I'm using that to do the physics integration on a background threat thread and only actually apply the updated positions of actors and that sort of thing in the foreground thread to when I'm actually drawing. So I read, but I don't write in the foreground. Um, likewise, you can use codensity of the, the function monad. Um, it's kind of a weird case, but it's actually a larger thing than reader. It actually has enough expressivity to define state. And the next release of fused effects will actually have an implementation of a state handler using that model. I mentioned Starlight. Well, I'm also using state in Starlight to model OpenGL state. OpenGL is an extremely stateful API. It has um, any number of things that you can essentially just get and put, including like Boolean operations um, where you are enabling or disabling some specific property. And that expresses really naturally using the state effect. So that's the interface that I'm using. And the reason that I want, wanted to be able to do that is that it allows me also to use combinators, et cetera, that have been defined abstracted over the state effect. So not a concrete action using state, but rather a combinator that says, as long as you've got some way to do stateful stuff, I can do some other stuff with whatever variable that is. I don't know anything about that variable. I don't care what it means, but I give you a way to, for example, use lenses with it. That's something that the lens uh, package op offers already. My colleague, Patrick Thompson has a package that um, provides a number of the same operations for fused effects, combining fused effects and lens. And so I'm using that to great effect in, in that, in, in Starlight. You could also have something that writes to disk or to a database or to the network, something that updates the interface, uh, something like the Shadow DOM uh, in React or something like that. You, If you know what the type is, your carrier can, for example, diff it and deal with updates to the interface by that means. That's a pretty cool capability. Um, and it also allows us to tackle stuff that's not just like get and put, which is this extremely you know, fine-grained thing, single mutable variable as we discussed, but also you know, business concerns, stuff like logging. We're not gonna talk about this in, in huge detail because of time considerations, but if we have an effect that describes logging, we might think of it as having two primary components, two primary operations. I'm gonna ignore for a moment these, uh, well, actually I'm gonna completely ignore these instances and uh, the definition of the data type itself and just talk about these operations. We have a log operation, which takes a log level, info, warning, or error, and a string, a message, and logs it. Um, and we have a labeling operation, which allows us to say that some portion of our uh, program is gonna be labeled in such and such a ma manner. And you can think of the labels as like, ideally they're like contextualizing the operations running within such that we would get a little bit extra uh, information stapled on to the log messages um, over just the, um, the string itself. So this isn't structured logging. I wouldn't recommend that you use this implementation of logging, but it's a very simple way to, to express the, the high level concerns in a way that can allow us to start thinking about what the desired properties would be. Now, I haven't actually proven any of these properties for any of the carriers that I'm about to show you. These are just ideas of what they could be, but they give us an idea of like where we would want to start thinking about these things. We probably want logged messages to be atomic. We don't want our writes, uh, our logged messages to like clobber each other when they're going to the console or wherever they're going. Um, we might want to say that we have thread local ordering. So not guarantee ordering between two different threads, but do guarantee it within a single thread of execution. We might want to have some sort of global ordering by means of timestamps or something like that, um, which might imply more synchronization between threads than would be otherwise be the case. But that might be a, a refinement of this law that might be important for our use case. Laws really depend on what we're trying to do with the things. And so that's a really important consideration here is that you might not get the exact properties you want right straight out of the gate. You might want to refine them as time goes on, as we discussed earlier. And then finally, labeling should contextualize messages in some way. I'm not discussing what that means here. It could be attaching data to the message. It could just be like wrapping sigils around the message. It really is determined by what your needs are. But we can already see that even without a precise formulation, formulation of the laws, we already have enough information or enough capability present to do some useful things. Like for example, we can have an interpreter for logging that logs in IO 
I, I don't remember if I actually have all of the details that I wanted. I do. Oh, I don't have that imported. OK, so control, uh, qualified control dot logging dot tree as tree. And then I'm going to do um, the IO one as IO and the identity one as identity. I apologize. I meant to have those imported already. Um, and now we can do something like um, I'm going to do that action again, but with the IO one. Uh, import data dot foldable, I believe. Yeah. OK, and so now we can see, OK, we're labeling a given span. And so everything within this span should be contextualized with the label span. Um, and we're just going to walk over every character in this string, make a string of just that single character, and then emit it as a warning. Um, we could also have just said info of hello. And we get the same thing, but not per character. Or we could say error, no. Um, uh, I guess I want to do something like that, actually, um, to see initially we have something that's not part of that span. And then after it, it is. And we could do the same thing having something uh, after the fact that is likewise not part of that span. So stuff within the scope of the span gets contextualized, other stuff doesn't. Great, so those are behaviors that that roughly correspond with the, the properties that we wanted. Uh, modulo atomicity, which I didn't discuss at all, or, and actually, which is explicitly not guaranteed by this implementation since it's just using put string on. Um, that, of course, is not the only implementation we might want. Like, yeah, sure, this might be fine if we're just operating within GHCI or within the CLI, but we might not want to do this in the tests because if it's just using put string line at some level, it's going to clobber our test output. It's going to make that really complicated to try to parse. And in fact, we might not want to worry about what our test, uh, our logging is in the tests at all. And for that purpose, we might want to use an impl implementation which just drops all of the logs. And so we have that here. And I, I'm not going to go into any detail about the implementations of these things. I'll leave that for further review. As I said, this is pushed up to GitHub, so you can feel free to review it at your leisure. Um, but the important detail here is that whatever the level and message were and whatever the name was, those are irrelevant to this implementation. We just drop it. Um, this is not going to give us an easy way to verify something like ordering because it doesn't have the same outputs as it had inputs. But it does give us the property that we can see that it's not going to like clobber our tests. And for something that we're just writing using in the tests alone, this is probably a perfectly reasonable implementation to start with, at least. In production, though, we might want something that's a little more subtle than that. Like, you know, maybe we'll have added some sort of like ASCII or um, sorry, extra coloring to our output for the CLI, but we don't want to use that in production. Or maybe we're using something in, in a, a context where we, we have some sort of observability software set up and we want to emit a single high cardinality request or response or event rather per request. And so in that case, we might want to do something where instead of actually emitting the data or just dropping it, we want to collect it so that we can output it later. And for that purpose, we might have something that collects it together into a single value, a tree, of type span here, which collects together any subspans and any messages at each level. So you can see that the top level global span has uh, a couple of messages, and it has a subspan for the nested thing. And maybe there's another expression of this we could have used using either and a single list of these so that we'd have sequencing uh, be coherent between messages and subspans messages. Um, again, not really salient to this specific discussion, but those are the sorts of implementation concerns that you want to be free to vary for other purposes or for, for arbitrary purposes. And so your laws ideally should not constrain you from doing that sort of thing. The modularity that we get as a result of these sorts of things allow us to do some pretty cool things. We can test without logging like we described. We can have different uh, logging behavior in CLI and in production as we discussed. We can even do things like test the behavior 
of logging in some specific action. Are we logging the things that we expect to be logging? If we're using a log logging per thing, we can even use that as a signal that we've been processing the number or the, the order of things that we expected to be uh, processing, um, all by substituting out a different uh, model of or a different implementation handler of these logging operations. So there's cases where this is useful. There's also cases where it isn't. And so real quick, I'm going to go through uh, a couple of indications for its use. I'd say don't just jump into modeling everything as an effect. Believe me, I've done it. It's tempting. Uh, it doesn't always go as well as you want, and it ends up uh, creating some, some resistance to change, or it maybe encourages you to, to have things abstracted at the wrong boundary. Really what you want to do is try to find a situation where you've got an interface that needs to be agreed on by different parts of the system. Maybe that's different producers, maybe that's different consumers, maybe it's both. By consumers and producers, I mean uh, actions, uh, consumers, actions using these effectful operations. And by producers, I mean different implementations handling them. Um, and you wanna be able to change these different parts of the system without a change here incurring a change in another one. In particular, you want to be able to change an implementation without changing every consumer of that implementation. That, if you don't have that sort of situation, then coupling to specific concrete types or implementations might not actually be that big of a deal. So don't overthink it, basically. Um, likewise, if operations should be collocated with other effectful operations within a single context. Remember, it's not just that each effect is a language, it's that they can also be combined piecemeal with other effects to make an even larger language. We have composition or combination of languages. Um, if you don't need that, maybe just a type class against some data type or other is gonna be sufficient for your needs. Or again, possibly some concrete implementation, concrete type. Uh, Likewise, when you want to tailor execution to different environments, dev, production, testing, or different inputs or different situations, those are great opportunities for this sort of thing because you'll very naturally run into multiple handlers. Or when you want to do analysis and instrumentation, those are really important tools and techniques from language design and, and language tools like abstract interpretation, static analysis, that we can actually apply within our programs using the knowledge that we have about our systems using this sort of model, using abstraction to provide implementations that give us that behavior. So an ideal case then is pretty general, ideally even one where we have combinators that we can define abstracted over the effects interface. So not just actions, but like combinators, like for example, the, the example I gave earlier of lens operators, which use monad state in the lens package or in Patrick's package, use fused effects state effect um, to provide the combination of lenses and these stateful operations. Um, those combinators are great. Uh, great use case. Parsers are another example. We have operations like, or combinators rather, like optional, which is defined in terms of the alternative uh, type classes, alternation operator and empty operator to say, we want zero or we want to parse a zero or one thing. Um, likewise, cases where operations and laws are clear, but note that they might not be clear when we start and that this can actually be a useful way to clarify them. My point is not that that's what the precondition should be, but that's sort of like what the ideal end state looks like. You can refine your way towards a case where you understand the laws very clearly, and that can actually be a really useful process for understanding your system in great detail and figuring out what those boundaries, what those interfaces really need to be. And further to that point, the ideal case is one that's been refined by experience. This is one where you've been using it. Um, one quick final thing to conclude with then, um, I, to recap, we have advantages both pragmatic and in terms of perspective from using effects. We can apply these things today and they lend us a really useful model for thinking about this that can encourage us to think about the relationships between parts of our system as a whole in terms of laws, for example. There's lots of different applications we could make for this that we haven't looked at. Some of the ones that we've done and some ones, ones we've thought about have included database access, file system access, network access, uh, time, very important if we're testing anything related to time, profiling, debugging tools, instrumentation, analysis, and even a REPL. Um, 
I'm not going to talk about systematization any further, but I want to leave you with a little bit of homework. One thing that you might want to think about is how to express the laws for something like logging. What, what properties do you want and how would you, you verify them? And then um, secondly, um, maybe define a teletype effect. Now, um, I had intended to actually write out what the interface for that would be. I'll direct you instead to the fused effects libraries readme since it, I believe, gives either, either the readme for fused effects gives the teletype example. It's more or less a canonical example. You want read line and write line. Try defining that and, and try thinking about what laws you would want it to abide by and what kind of implementations you could have. Um, and finally, thanks and acknowledgments. I want to thank my team, um, especially Tim Clem, Eamon Nadim, Rebecca Valentine, and Patrick Thompson for all of their help, encouragement, and support. And also the research community, especially Nicholas Wu and Tom Trivers, who are the authors of a lot of the work that uh, is behind Fused Effects. And also Paul Hudak for the, uh, the phrase he gave us, DSLs are the ultimate abstraction. I am delighted to say that all of my experience uh, in my career has just proven him right. Um, so thank you very much for listening. And it looks like we're going to go to Q&A now. Yeah, so we have a little time for a few questions. Um, so one question from Gimli is, uh, imagine if you write this effect called throw error, but mm -hmm. then later you figure out that you actually want to make a separation between throw error where you can catch the exception and a throw error where you don't really care about that. How easy is it to refactor these things? Um, pretty easy. It really depends on the specific, like it depends how, how and where you want to define that divide, I would say. Like our experience with the error effect in particular is that we were able to do it without code changes to most of the use cases of the fused effects library. Um, semantic is always our biggest use case, right? So we're always concerned with like, does this express well within that? And the change we made to error was not a really significant change to any of the actions written against it. It was more significant for specific carriers. They had to care about the distinction but because the distinction was primarily at the level of data type and not at the level of like the smart constructors, users were able to still say something like, you know, has error in their constraints. And that gave them the has throw constraint that they actually needed to be able to call throw error. And then if they wanted to say something more precise after the fact to say, well, actually, I'm never going to catch in this. I'm only ever going to throw. That's just easy. They can re re uh, swap out error for throw at their discretion later on. Uh, likewise, we didn't really have any particular fallout for semantic from the change to non-dead. Uh, it's definitely possible to imagine other formulations, like things that change the signature of the smart constructors significantly, which would, however, uh, cause that sort of upheaval. That's the same as any interface changes to shared interfaces are going to require refactoring changes. Uh, thank you. One very different question. Where can we find more information about your game Starlight? <laughs> uh, so it's on my GitHub as well. Um, I'll add it to the um, links here. Um, I will warn you, I, I say the word game. It's not actually something very fun right now. You can fly around the solar system, but it's not. there's not like much gameplay there. Um, I'm still figuring out how to be a game developer. But this is, yeah, Thank at any rate, this is the URL. Maybe um, one more question since we're slowly running out of time. Um, we have a question from Alexei. Um, how would you use a few, how would you use fused effects together with some sort of bracket pattern if you care about uh, releasing resources? That's a great question. Um, one way you can do that is by modeling the resources you want to control the effect. Uh, another one is via the lift effect that fused effects provides. It allows you to work with, for example, the actual definition of bracket given in control.exception. Um, we have some examples of how to do that specifically somewhere. Um, basically, it's the entirety of control.exception's uh, definitions just abstracted over the lift effect instead of just being an IO. Um, there are some caveats about that with handlers for state and using something like finally, where since a handler for state, if it's using state T, for example, it's going to communicate state changes via the return value and finally drops those. Um, there are situations like that where you would uh, potentially run into problems that, that this, does, this doesn't resolve. Uh, I would call that future work. Um, but 
It's what we're using in semantic, for example, to do this sort of thing. Actually, okay. I can't say that Thank for you. sure. We're using one of those two approaches, and I've definitely used the other one in Starlight. So. Um. Again, thank you for your talk then, and thanks for answering these questions. Um, we're going to cut out now, and then we'll be back in half an hour on the our YouTube channel with the GAC track. Um, so have fun during the hackathon, and thank you again, Rob, for your talk. Thank you. Bye.